in the Bible. And then, of course, people got Bibles in their own language, and they started reading them and thinking and discussing. And so we, then we had about 250 years of religious war while everybody was figuring out, well, what does it really mean? But in the process, lots of other books were printed as well. And so uh, in 1648, we got some peace back and the beginning of the sort of the modern Europe of modern states. And you can see that Germany has been, uh, had a pretty bad time in its religious wars. That's pretty much gone. But you can see there the beginnings of the modern Europe already coming about. So spreading knowledge, we've been doing it for a while. Of course, before 1440, we did it through other means, but that was very slow. The book accelerated it uh, 10,000 fold. But since the late 60s, of course, we've been doing the next revolution where we take computers and we connect them to each other. We now have several billion over the planet. Half of them are mobile phones. And they're all connected together. The price has gone so low that everybody has one or, each, or several. Even in a country like Brazil, there are 100 million plus mobile phone users now. So it's going very fast. And I think this revolution will be as fundamental as the last revolution of 500 years ago. Except it won't take 500 years for the revolution to play out. It's going to take maybe 50 or 60 years, and half of them are gone. So we are going to see more change because of this in the next 30 years than we saw over the last 500 in our societies. Again, that's how fundamental it is. Now, computers have been involving at um, uh, a geometric rate for over a century. And this is sort of a, a one-slide picture. You can see it, how much computing power you get for an amount of money. Um, it's still going up, and a, a crisis or no crisis makes no difference. And it means that computers now do everything. So we go shopping through our computer. We do banking through our computer, which can be a bit tricky, but you can do it. Um, we get our music through our computers. Of course, if you're a hacker, you get your music by this channel. Um, Computers now predict who is going to win a sports competition. They can drive cars autonomously, even in uh, you know, cities. Um, there's lots of things you can do. We now have 3D printers run by cheap computers that can not only replicate themselves, but also produce all kinds of great things. Um, there are some uh, demos of that uh, at our right here. So computers aren't just typewriters, which is the old view, certainly within government, that people had. You know, a PC is just a typewriter, except it's a bit easier. It's much, much more fundamental than that. It is how we communicate with each other, and certainly in a secure way. It's how we organize each other if we you know, want to do political protesting or something like that. We want to change something. They run effectively our factory, and our entire industrial economy is dependent on computers and software. And of course, there are still some countries where people actually vote on computers, not in this country, luckily. But there is still one computer involved, even in the Dutch voting system, which is one central system that tabulates all the other analog paper um, uh, votes at the, end of the, at the end of the evening. I'll get back to this later in the talk. And of course, the computers are the new printing presses. So now we all have our own printing press, and we all have blogs and Twitter accounts, and we can all talk to the world, and then the world can talk back to us. So if the computers are the printing presses, and we want freedom of the press, then it's important that not one or two companies own all the presses or own the software that makes the press do something. We need some diversity there. So in other media, for instance, television in, in Europe, uh, no single company or entity can own more than 30% in a country. So for instance, in the Netherlands, you know, a, a single commercial entity cannot own more than 30% of all the television channels. And we think it's good to have that diversity so we have many voices and keep our democracy going. Now, of course, in software land, this is not the case at all. Um, not only do we have enormous concentration of power and but we also get all kinds of funny rules that come with the software. This is an example of a software license from Microsoft front page, which you may remember as a program you use to make really crappy web pages. Um, but basically it says we're going to sell you the software, and then we're going to say what you can and cannot do with it. So it's like buying a pen, and then it has a little sticker on the box that says, you know, you cannot write negative things about the Parker Corporation with this pen. I mean, would you buy such a pen? Would you even, you know, take that seriously? Well, this is what is in the license, and I dare anyone to you know, pick a legal fight with Microsoft. You need seriously have deep pockets and have a lot of lawyers. So there are many reasons to want um, a different way of how we do software and who controls software, who builds it, getting the diversity. These are some of the reasons, and you, sort of, you can pick one you like, uh, depending on you know, where you're coming from and what your sort of political background is. Uh, I'll, I'll go over some of you. For my participation in, the, in this whole thing, I started with this. 
This is a screenshot I made on January 1st, 2002, when I tried to uh, go to the website of the National Railway uh, to uh, plan a train trip, as I do often. And instead of uh, showing me the planner, it showed me this. And it says, you don't have Internet Explorer. This site only works with Internet Explorer. Go here to download Internet Explorer. And there I was sitting on my ThinkPad with Red Hat 5 point something, for which there is no Internet Explorer. So, I mean, the Dutch Railway is, you know, it's still state-owned nominally. Uh, so it's, it's more or less a public utility, and it was telling me, unless you buy Microsoft Windows, we, you know, you can't come in. You're not welcome here. So I was quite, uh, quite uh, pissed about that. So I wrote a very angry email to um, some, uh, uh, some people from the National Railway. But then I thought, well, you know, the webmasters, he probably can't help it either. So let me um, uh, copy in some people. So I copied in um, people from, uh, from Parliament, people from the Ministry of Transport, and some journalists. And I stopped at about 50, because then it becomes spam. And I got a mail back from the railway uh, that says, uh, OK, well, you know, we heard your complaint, and we have had a lot of complaints. We're going to do something about it. And uh, two weeks later, they had a new site that didn't have any of these problems. But I also got a mail back from um, a member of parliament from the Greens Party. And that mail became a conversation and a series of conversations over a series of months. And we said, look, there is a fundamental problem with the way we have IT, certainly at the PC level. Um, and the government needs to step in, basically, to intervene, because the market obviously can't solve it, otherwise it would have done so. So on 19th of November 2002, we had a motion in Parliament, um, which was unanimously adopted, which is quite rare for a, a motion from the Greens Party, that says, OK, we have a failure of the way the software market is, is working in the Netherlands, and the government needs to step in. And one of the ways the government can do that is to use open source and open standards as much as possible itself, since it's one of the biggest software players. So um, the first guy there on the, on the line, Kees Vendrick, he uh, you know, became a very good friend because, of course, as a uh, member of parliament for a small political party, he doesn't get to have many of those sort of unanimous motions in parliament. So um, now, of course, I had his mobile number, and I could, uh, you know, point him in certain directions and help him out with things. Um, so I kept feeding him and other people information and the sort of item advanced on the political agenda very, very slowly. Um, and so you need to draw in people from other political parties and they will have other things they will listen to. So this is sort of my experience on uh, different Dutch political parties. Uh, so this is from left to right on the political spectrum, which still tells you something. Um, and it tells you some of the issues that might be, um, might be good for that party. So lower cost, everybody loves lower cost. Lower cost is always good, if you can prove it, of course, which can be difficult. Social inclusion, transparency, those kinds of things tend to be sort of more leftish uh, issues. And of course, local business, national security tend to be more uh, to the right. But um, lots of things can uh, work everywhere. I mean, things like you know, proper functioning of the market, everybody is nominally in favor of that. But uh, when it comes to big business, certain political parties like to support them too. Um, so this is uh, the Netherlands. Your local mileage may vary in other countries, but it works like this basically. So in 2003, some few things happened, but not a lot. But in 2004, we got a bit of uh, movement on the, in the dossier when the government tried to buy 150 million euros worth of software without going through the proper you know, procedure of buying software. If you're a European government and you want to spend public money, there is a process that you need to document. If you want to spend more than, I think, 150,000 euros, for instance, on software, you need to document you know, why you choose that software and not the other one and things like that. And so, um, the government didn't do that, but they were...